Welcome everyone to the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Greg Garrett, uh, a consultant in the connectivity and connected vehicle and connected as a general space and also a personal friend. So thank you, Greg, for joining me here today. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you as a, as a consultant in a in a connected world that uh, has far advanced over the last five to 10 years. So maybe to start out with, maybe quickly explain what you're doing nowadays, and then uh, let's get into what you see as mobility and connectivity and connecting and competing in that world. If you bring all this together, what do you understand out of all this? Oh, just that? No, no problem. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Stefan, we were just talking before we hit record that uh, you were on my podcast years ago, so help, helping me get my uh, my podcast launched. So it's great to return the favor here. Uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I mean, really simply put, uh, I've been in and around the mobility automotive space for a number of years. Uh, first as a consultant with, uh, with a with big company, Ernst & Young, and then joined uh, some su- subsidiaries of Volkswagen, and then did uh, some stints with some uh, some other German firms, Deutsche Telekom, uh, really looking at connectivity well beyond the auto industry, and then back into the auto industry, and then joined VW proper uh, as the as chief strategy officer for IT and innovation, and that all ended about eleven years ago. And I took all that experience and teamed up with some folks that uh, were were with me along that journey and launched CGS Advisors, and, and we advise leaders how to better compete in the connecting world for the most part. And that can mean a lot of different things. Sometimes that's uh, helping them to def- define their strategy, their business strategy, their corporate strategy. Sometimes it's helping them think through their technology strategy or, or enable some aspects of it. A lot of times it has to do with removing inertia because big successful companies that have uh, maybe maybe competed in one way before uh, connectivity was such a big thing, they need to really think of how do they remove the barriers? How do they make change re- real uh, to, to drive it out? And sometimes one of those answers is innovation. So helping them set up innovation practices. Mm-hmm. So we've been doing that for about 11 years. Big companies, small companies, startups, everything in between, having a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, at the end, tail end, you asked me to just kind of reflect a little bit on what mobility is and, and what, what connectivity uh, or what the connected world really is. And maybe two uh, two answers. Connected world first. We look at that as as really the world. Put uh, put the human in the center. Put the human on the outside. We've got a picture that we use oftentimes. Uh, the world used to be pretty simple uh, hundreds and thousands of years ago. Before there was a lot of uh, a lot of things in the world, a lot of uh, technology in the world. Uh, people sat around campfires and they, they they hunted and gathered and they they communicated and they survived and they built ecosystems, but micro ecosystems. We've made the world pretty complex, uh, <clears throat> a lot of things, a lot of places, a lot of modes of transportation, a lot of information flowing. The connected world is uh, really all those things uh, interacting. And we think that the world's moving towards more and more of those things being connected, producing information. Mm-hmm. And if we do it right, uh, that should make life simpler. It should make things easier. Um, it should make it less friction filled for all those humans that are in that world. If we do it wrong, it's less secure, it's more friction filled, a lot of uh, things that don't integrate and it's, uh, it's a connected world but, a, but in some ways a, a much more disconnected world because we've got to work through all those barriers. So we're trying to see the world uh, through that positive lens of all these things. We like to say uh, everything is becoming everything, a, a big network of things. Mm-hmm. And some of those things are mobility, uh, some of those <laughs> things move. And I mean, there's classic definitions of uh, movement of people and goods and, and information. And uh, someone smarter than me said on one of my podcasts probably about a year ago, uh, mobility is more about the moving people less uh, these days. Probably it's uh, it's about moving goods and making life friction frictionless to bring bring the right information or the right things to the people, and sometimes bringing the people to people as well. But it's all those things. It's uh, it's the movement uh, within that connected world that that is mobility for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. So when you think about the shifts in mobility, and you and I often have a, have discussions about that, right? When we get together on on how fast, let's say, even connectivity has has improved from 15 years ago when I first got into telematics, right? And you and I got to know each other. To today, I mean, back then, you know, when we had a 3G signal, we're like, yes, you know, today, if we don't have 5G, it's like, oh, my gosh, it's slow. I can't deal with it. So certainly a lot of stuff just in the traditional connectivity, but it's not necessarily where you are in. It's not just cellular connectivity. It's the connectivity of lots of different things and how different pieces come together. 
But when, when we look at mobility, what, what have you seen changing and what, what does this mean to you that today, as far as I know, at least, you know, you're doing your consulting as it relates to how do you compete in a, in a connected world or ever more connected world in for healthcare, you do it for telecommunications, you do it for automotive companies, so really not just mobility itself, but if you look at how mobility has changed, how much is the connectivity a part of that? How much is it a, an influencer? How much is it a side product? Share a little bit of light from your perspective on that. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, there's so many terms out there. We, we years ago, maybe inappropriately, we, we kind of uh, decided to latch onto this connected world term, which some people will, as you said, some people will interpret that as meaning it's really the connections itself. It's the, it's the infrastructure, it's the telecommunication. It, it was definitely influenced during my days at Deutsche Telekom. It was more of terms that were coming out of the telecom mm -hmm. space. But you're right. We see that as uh, it's really all the interoperability. It's the blurring of all these things, uh, blurring of industries, uh, blurring of, of the, the experiences that need to inform one another across someone's daily life. So to bring it back, what are we seeing and, and the acceleration? What we've seen is a lot of actually the technology. So we would call just the grouping of technologies, the connected world technologies, no matter if that's the, the cloud infrastructure or if it's the, the 5G or other communication uh, technologies or edge compute, uh, things getting small enough, uh, fast enough, cheap enough to be able to embed inside of products where they, you know, like contact lenses or grains of rice size pills that go inside of humans' bodies, just all the things that can go out all the way to the edge where processing can actually happen to the ability to, for people, willingness, humans, willingness to actually generate information. We've seen all these basic changes of technologies and the applications of technologies be pre-invested in. So the last several decades, this, this couldn't have been imaginable when, we, when, when you and I were first meeting because the, the capital cost for a lot of these industries and the way that their businesses worked would never have been able to afford all this technology investment. Well, over the last couple of decades, the, the, the investment's been made. And now, and, and especially with new pricing models around some of the technology, you can just you know, rent the rent it. Uh, mm -hmm. you, everything as a service, if you will. So what we've seen is disruptive business models. That technology has already been invested in. The application of the technology is starting to happen. And so what we're seeing accelerated is uh, companies applying that technology to disrupt their industry, which really means they're using it to try to drive different business models. Uh, it really means their corporate strategy, the business that they're in, is starting to shift. And, and if it's not that, it's definitely the way they compete. Their business strategy is starting to shift. And so that's what we're seeing is uh, new entrants, uh, disruptive forces to markets, a race to uh, access particular capabilities that are necessary to compete in a different way. And that's what we spend a lot of time doing is helping firms think that through. Is are they are they being disrupted? Could they are they in a position that they control a set of resources that they potentially could be part of the disruptive force? Mm -hmm. And if regardless of either one of those, func more functionally, what are they going to do about it? How are they going to deliver in this connected space? That's the majority of the time what we're, we're spending and uh, spending time helping clients do. And it is. It's just getting faster and faster. People, people that are deciding to sit on the sidelines and see, you know, let's let's see how this connected kind of world plays out. They're just being left left out. They're losing market share. Uh, they're they're being locked out of ecosystems that are that are necessary to be in to be able to play. And they're not going out of business yet. Most of them. Uh, but it's the yet that that they should be concerned about. If those ecosystems cement, getting into the ecosystem later is going to be hard. And it's just going to be a slow drawdown for some of these traditional players. And so we're trying to help leaders battle and get in front of that, that, uh, that change. Mm -hmm. You've, you've, you're the author of this, of this book here, competing in a connecting world. Right. And, and, you know, you've given me that as a present, uh, a while back. And I still oftentimes remember when I read it the first time, how a lot of things made perfect sense. But I think it was the individual Lego pieces that made perfect sense, but not necessarily recognizing them when you bring the stuff together. That's really when the connected world really starts to bring benefits for an individual, for a company, for an entire society, right? And, and always recognizing, again, another example of one plus one might be three and not two in this case. But if you take that book for a moment and and it is not necessarily focused on on the mobility space or on the automotive space 
but how does the, the context or the things that you're teaching or highlighting in this book really apply to the mobility space? Because I think it's important, certainly at AVL, right? There's a lot of things that five years ago we didn't consider the cloud for. We didn't consider connecting with other products, connecting with some of our uh, capabilities and technologies. Today we do, or today we're certainly on the path to do it. Maybe not fast enough, maybe too fast in some cases, because the market might not be ready. But how do you see your book apply to what you're talking about to the mobility space? Yeah, well, thank you for, for, for showing it. And, uh, and and you've been a great partner along the way, especially coming into the, the classroom where we use the book to, to teach uh, in the MBA course. You've been guest lecturer for us many times, being the expert in the <laughs> auto space. So I should turn the question around to you because you, you, you actually represented the students quite a bit. But Generically, maybe a couple of things. First of all, we, the uh, the book was co-authored myself and, and my co-author, Dr. Warren Ritchie. We, uh, we we cemented a lot of the concepts while we were actually at a big global automotive company, a product company, an OEM, because uh, we felt uh, the early aspects of how this connectivity, the, the shifts in capabilities that that would allow uh, a company to compete differently, either against us or us against them. We could feel that's what actually shaped what's in the book. So it, even though it's not about mobility, a lot of the examples, the framework was written while we were there to, together really originally uh, that some of the concepts started coming clear. Um, secondarily, uh, inside of it, you'll see that the book traces through uh, a framework of transformation. Uh, we call it the first mile framework. Um, it's the first mile of transformation. And, and as you said, there's no real unique one piece of this framework, but we think the uniqueness is actually putting it together. So just very quickly, there's a, a layer that explains what happens at industry as new technologies come out. Why do they, why does disruption happen to industries? There's a layer that's around the firm. So what does a, does a company in that industry need to do? Creating new strategies, trying to understand what capabilities are necessary. How do they get access to the capabilities and actually doing something with them? And maybe the most interesting one and the most generic, the one that can apply to really any firm is the leadership level at the very top. And it basically just takes through three steps that says you need to imagine what the disruptive potential of these changes might look like that will allow you to then support new strategies and new capability building. You need then to assess where you are. Do you have these capabilities? Do you have access to these capabilities or you don't? If you if you're a leader of a firm that has a lot of the capabilities that are necessary to compete in the future in your future business model, you will likely see this as an opportunity and you will run towards it. If you, on the other hand, are a leader inside of a firm that looks at all the capabilities necessary and you say, actually, I don't have many of those, you will potentially be uh, a desperate a little bit, fear-based, and you also may run to it. It may need to do something a little different, like sell a division to get enough capital to be able to acquire the new capabilities. And then the, the third step is actually having the, the bravery to do something, because all those first two are really planners. It, it's perspective setting and planning. The last one is actually being brave enough to do something, and that's where you have to remove a lot of the inertia. How does it apply to the mobility? Well, that's what's going on in, in most of the mobility market. Product companies becoming services companies, new entrants that have built their company on all new sets of capabilities, competing against uh, uh, more traditional firms that were built maybe in a different time, no matter if that's the powertrain, uh, you know, ICE moving to EV or um, unconnected uh, uh, product companies individually owned moving towards more connected fleet, uh, pay per service, uh, maybe more fleet management uh, being what was an OEM may actually be more of like a tier 0.5 now because they're building vehicles for fleet companies and still having some kind of involvement. All these different uh, aspects apply to mobility companies. They apply to healthcare companies. And the last piece uh, is because those industries are blurring, two things are happening. One, you're competing the exact same skills that are necessary for the mobility company. Say, let's take something like AI. It's being implied at the same rate, uh, the same desire as a healthcare company. So you're competing. Wait, wait, before you'd just be competing for mechanical engineers, perhaps, and you and the and the competition set was much different. Now you're competing for uh, data scientists or people that uh, experts in AI. All industries are competing for them at the same time. So the competition landscape is really, really shifting. And then secondarily, it's just human nature. Uh, dominant logic exists in in every leader. Uh, leaders are usually there because they've succeeded. Uh, they need to break some of their own rules to be able to succeed in a new way. So the framework, the book, just makes people think. It's a guidebook. It's it's written for the, the top leader of an organization and anybody else who wants to be a top leader to just think differently. And mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a reminder. There's, as, as you well said, and, and I'll round with this, there's no one aspect of it that, uh, that should, when you read it, say, that's new. But putting all the thoughts in one place might be new. And that's what we tried to do. And, and I hope some mobility leaders uh, might get some value out of it.
Well, I got, I got value out of it, and I, I like to believe that I try to apply some of that thought leadership or certainly the, the technology leadership that I believe is really what's pushing forward the mobility space. Uh, the book certainly has helped me tremendously. Maybe, maybe touching upon the, the point of you uh, also lecturing at, uh, at Oakland University here in Michigan and uh, giving me the opportunity to come in and, and guest lecture. Over, over the last several years, you've given me the title sort of talk about, you know, from automotive to mobility, which is a very, very, very fitting terminology because, again, you and I have talked about this numerous times and you alluded to it in, in, in some of your areas already to it, answers already to it, is the industry, the automotive industry really have has transformed itself through a lot of causes, a lot of disruptions and transformation movements, right? And I think the key here is disruption, transformation, leading to new innovations, truly from, let's say, automotive to much more broad mobility on the ground, in the air, all over the place, right? When, when you look at, let's say, 10 years back to when you first started teaching at Oakland, what, what has the student body changed as it relates to mindset of the connected world, mindset of the mobility world around them. It would be interesting to see, do you see a trend in the students more picking it up and moving faster? Do you still see somewhat of a, until they read this book, it just like wasn't obvious, but then boom, it becomes obvious or, or share a little bit about that. Yeah, I, th I think the biggest difference, uh, that maybe the most obvious difference, I I'd say, is uh, when I first launched the, the, the course, first of all, I had no idea what I was doing, and they invited me in, so thanks, Oakland. Uh, uh, but I, I figured it out over the last 10 years. Um, but one of the first things that we would talk about in, 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 the, in the first lecture uh, series or the first, the first class is I, I'd ask the students to imagine what... Uh, uh, the things that could be connected in the world and they would struggle. And so I would have to explain to them, well, let's think through uh, why this desk might be connected. I mean, I'd literally just walk around the classroom and, and give them ideas of how inanimate objects, objects around them might be connected and how they would bring different value if they were, et cetera. Well, shift that 10 years and, and the question has actually changed. What won't be connected? Uh -huh. And they struggle with what won't be so at the beginning we I had to explain what what a connected product was what a what a product that would provide a service is why information would flow it was a, it was a real slow and then it would accelerate quickly now it's almost the opposite is they just assume everything's going to be connected um, what I would say is similar on, on the on the other hand is the thing that hasn't uh, accelerated quite as fast is people now know everything's going to be connected. They don't quite understand how, how how to compete in that space, or specifically how to make money in it. And mm -hmm. I see this not only in the classroom, but also in the entrepreneurial uh, space. A lot of times, people say, "Well, data the, the data will, will will bring the value." Oh, that's interesting. Nice broad statement. As an investor, uh, okay, at least I'll show up now. Uh, but how? how how is it going to bring the value? And that hasn't changed over the last uh, ten years. There's some there's some people that are imagining connecting some really interesting things that can can be connected now because of all this uh, investment, but why someone will find any value? How are you going to make someone's life easier? Where are you going to remove costs? Uh, how is this information going to be consumed by some other company that will then be able to write? That's still uh, people are still struggling with that. So I think that's mm. I think that's really the, the struggle of the executive oftentimes when they're helping and needing to support what the product strategy is going to be. Um, that still seems to be the, the 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 classic issue that I think we'll still get a few more years out of that in the classroom. Interesting. Maybe I'll put you on the spot a little bit with this one, but if you as a professor, right, which you are part-time professor, if you yep. had to grade um, all the executives that you've worked with so far over your 11-year career in, 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 the, in the consulting space related to how much they really grasp the concept of competing in a connected world, again, exactly what you just said, yep. I need my phone connected, of course, but I also need my water cup. I need my, my, I need my desk. I need my computer. I need my car. I need my everything connected to the cloud. That's almost, quote, unquote, the obvious and given now, right, that we recognize that, I hope at least. But recognizing as how you as a leader are supposed to take that and now compete within it, find a new niche, expand your niche, your product, new products, whatever, what grade would you, would you give us? I put myself in that position too. You've worked with me. What grade would you give us when it comes to that? 
Well, I'm a pretty easy grader, so uh, I, I'll come off the grade maybe. But I mean, in general, I think it's going to be like a, a, a bell curve anywhere. The the challenging thing, the reason it's it's hard to grade, or the reason that I would I would give, maybe give a a curve is the the landscape in which you're grading it. The landscape with these leaders are, are leading is the landscape is changing at all the times, and so it's a it's a it's a bit of a position of the firm of how aggressive they can be. You know, I, I like to say be brave. Uh, it's how I sign all my all my messages is how I sign off on the, on the, on my podcast. Um, it's, uh, these are all things that, that bravery, uh, the aggressiveness of the bravery is probably going to depend a little bit on the positioning of the market for the firm that they're in and, and the particular, uh, landscape of the industry. But you, you said, you started off with how many of them grasp it. I think more and more of them are grasping it. I think we've maybe moving from a C to a, you know, a B plus a minus or something. Doing something about it is still uh, is where the question is, and I can't necessarily grade them down for not being aggressive on it or not doing more, because sometimes their firms aren't ready for it. Uh, sometimes the marketplace is still shifting around them, and their shareholders, especially with a public company, their shareholders expect uh, uh, some return right now. They want to see the revenue, they want to see the profit, they want to see the dividend right now, uh, where they're let's say 80% still in the old world, but 20% in the new world, the grade is kind of maybe a delayed grade. The, the question is when, when leaders look at their back of themselves, I think most of them can grade themselves or be graded uh, within the 12 month cycle, within the fiscal calendar year, pretty darn good. If they're going to grade their career, uh, the question I would have is, you know, after 15 more years, have they set those companies up for long-term success Will they be giving themselves a C minus? Well, eh, passing, but uh, maybe we could have been bigger. Uh, or will they be giving them an A plus? That's a lot of the times the struggle. And mm -hmm. there's no right answer. It's just I, I'd like them to think about clearly that they're making the decision both in the short term and long term. And it's a decision. It's not someone. It's not the next guy or gal's problem. It's a decision you're making. And what I see is private held companies are oftentimes making a little bit more of the long-term gain, especially if they're family-owned, uh, where, where it's going to be handed down to the next generation, where some of the public or the uh, private equity held, where they're trying to get a return in a, in a unique number of years, they're, they're hedging. They're telling a story about the future, but they're really trying to hedge for the return today. And that, as I said, I'm not going to grade them. It's the, it's the wrong game because I think they're actually playing two different games. So that's, that's the reality I see. Okay. Very good. Greg, I appreciate it very much. Very insightful and always great talking to you. And uh, for everyone else, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.